Okay, welcome to Joyful Momentum Book Club. Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Belmont. I'm the Director of Faith Formation for MCCW Worldwide, and I'm being joined by Elizabeth Conlin, our Director of Finance. But besides being a whiz with the numbers, unlike me, she is a whiz with the words. She wrote a book called Joyful Momentum about women's ministry. And over the next five weeks, we're going to be discussing how to apply the lessons learned to our situation with reopening after COVID-19, reopening our chapels. Uh, so this week we're discussing our the introduction and chapter one. So Elizabeth, could you just kind of let us know why you wrote the book and who, who it's for? Yep, so I wrote Joyful Momentum and it, it came to being over a lot of years of you know, just really wanting to, I, I love to write. And so I wanted to, to share my words in a way that would encourage other women to any chapel group, especially within the military archdiocese, but even beyond the military archdiocese, that would encourage anyone who wanted to start a women's ministry or retool an existing women's ministry to have some, some best practices and some spiritual encouragement along the way. So the book is organized so that every chapter is part kind of spiritual encouragement from either church teaching or a woman saint. Um, there's some good men saints in there too, but a lot of women saints. And then just good stories along the way of experiences that I've had in women's ministry. And I've taken these experiences and church teaching and spiritual reflection and kind of formulated eight chapters of best practices for to answer the question of how do I start a women's ministry? Because with the Military Council of Catholic Women, which is obviously the, the ministry that we work with, with the MCCW, every time I attend a retreat or a conference, women have questions about um, how to engage new people or how to build leaders or how to have transitions in women, women's ministry, how to build the relationship with their with their priest. And so I wrote the book to answer those questions and give them some encouragement. And also it was, it was a good time for me um, personally, just to reflect on the great friendships I've made through women's ministry, the great blessings that it's been to my life, um, not only to me personally, but, but to my family. I think my entire family has benefited from the women that I've met and the church communities that have grown um, that I've been able to grow in through through the MCCW and then just women's ministry in general. So that's why. So, I how do you think <laughs> this book can help women in chapel groups as we slowly reopen? I'm here in New York. I'm excited to go to my first mass this weekend. My first mass since March, and we were just talking about how you've been to mass once. I think you said so far. So, yeah. yeah, so, you know, we're on both sides of the country and there's everything in between. And, um, and of course, we're world, worldwide. So how can this book help ch chapel groups as they reopen after um, COVID-19? Yeah, so, okay, so if you look at the table of contents of the book, um, it really, like I tried to get back to the basics in the book. So COVID-19, if anything, has been um, challenging. It's been chaotic, um, but it's also been a very distinct cry to us to slow down. Like it's kind of like an upper room experience, like go home and wait. And what does that waiting look like? You know, eventually we come, we come out of waiting, and in these, in these COVID days, we've had a lot of time to, to kind of pare down to the basics. So if you look at, at, if you have an existing women's ministry, I suspect that during COVID, if you've met at all, and a lot of groups just aren't meeting, um, it's been on Zoom yeah. and to try to keep that interpersonal connection. Um, and then a lot of questions have come up of, what do I do? So in the military, it's springtime. Everybody's getting ready to move or, you know, PCS, permanent change of station, if you're not military, but people are getting ready to move. So it's a good time to look at, you know, how do I restart my, my women's ministry group and recruit new leaders when 
a lot of our previous leaders have left, um, how do we encourage the previous leadership to leave, um, to leave some continuity for the people who are going to come behind them <laughs> to some files or training or <laughs> So that they just don't go, whoop, I'm out. And then, and then the new group coming in is, is left not knowing what happened six weeks ago because our military life is so transient. So the book builds in some practices for having continuity and having a transition of leadership and selecting new leaders. Um, and then also just really just getting back to the fundamentals of of forming spiritual friendships between people in your community as the basis to start a women's ministry. And so restarting a women's group after COVID, I hope has, you know, COVID has pared away all of the, I'm going to use the word superfluous, but I don't mean it in a bad way. Like has pared away all of the superfluous stuff from women's ministry. So in a, in a typical Catholic women of the chapel group or MCCW group, um, you have your faith study and your potluck breakfast and your child care and your book study and you might have an outreach group and pilgrimages and ladies night out. Okay, well, COVID happened. What are you left with? We're left with prayer and we're left with online faith study and online fellowship. So in a very real way, we've reverted. It's almost like a kind of like a remnant, like we've reverted back to the very foundation of what a CWOC is, you know, the CWOC pins that we wear and the MCCW pins that we wear, they say spirituality, leadership, and service. And so COVID in a way has given us the opportunity, like a real opportunity, if we want to look at the positive on it, to get back to spirituality. How are we praying for our communities? How are we praying with each other? Um, leadership, how are we, how are, and you can engage in outreach digitally, but we are missing our faith is incarnational and we are missing, we're, we're missing out not being able to meet in person. And I, I, I don't think anyone would argue with that. I think we're, we're just missing it. You know, we're missing, we're missing hugs. We're missing high fives. We're missing holding each other's babies. We're missing doing all these things that are so natural to us. But, um, but we have the opportunity to get back to our spirituality. We can get creative about leadership and we can get creative about how we're serving each other through our faith studies. So in the introduction of the book, um, you know, every chapter of the book ends with a scripture reflection. And in the very first chapter, I used um, the Acts 2 community of they dedicated themselves to the breaking of the bread and the prayers, and they shared all things in common. And then the verse goes on, but it says in each day, um, you know, people were, the Lord added to their number, those who were being saved. And so our communities coming out of COVID can look very much like that acts to community if if we take the opportunity to get back to to the fundamentals of our of our faith and fellowship. That is a very hopeful vision, <laughs> and that's great because I think sometimes we're like so scared now, like oh no, like what are we gonna do? You know, like how am I supposed to recruit catechists? You know, if I can't see people and and how you know how can I do this? I had a big win. Um, just by asking somebody, you know, we didn't have a faith study leader for next year. And I just reached out and this lady could have thought I was crazy, but I reached out and asked, I said, there's a need. And she responded, yes. And I, but I also said I would be with her. I Are said, you? yeah, that I would accompany her and I wouldn't let her down, whatever support she needed. So that was important, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And the ability that you were able to reach out to someone, even like even from your computer or digitally, you know, it's not like you could go knock on her door or go, you know, run to the back of the church as she's leaving and, and go find her, but that you're able to reach, you know, it's an example of you are still able to reach out during COVID. We don't have to put the halt on the gospel. You know, Lord knows if the gospel were hard. Um, Jesus, would, I mean, Jesus preached under hard circumstances. He lived under hard circumstances. You know, we don't have to stop spreading the gospel just because it gets hard. If anything, we should, we should try harder. So, so you're, that you were still able to recruit someone is awesome. Um, you don't have to mind that uh, maxim, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Yes, perfect would be like, I don't know, like an engraved invitation. <laughs> like, would you please join us? And the good is like, there's a need and we need you. And is this, do you feel like 
this would be a good use of your gifts. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and that's a key, that's a key, um, a key question to ask someone that you're trying to recruit. You know, chap the second chapter of the book is on looking at women's ministry as a vocation, um, meaning how, you know, we're called to know, love, and serve God and be happy with them in this world and the next. How does your work on this earth help you um, to know, love, and serve God and be happy with him in this world and the next? How are you offering your gifts to serve other people? So it's a key question to ask someone, not just like, hey, I need a faith study leader. Will you lead the faith study? But like, hey, I've seen this gift in you. We really have a need. Would you be willing to offer your gift? And that's, that's an invitation that gives someone the opportunity to pray about it and give a discerned yes or a discerned no. And either is good. A, a holy no is a good no. So. Yes. One thing I love about your book is all the little uh, personal stories in it. And so I was, yeah, I was reading in the introduction about Nicole and Nicole's offer to help and how you were reflecting and you remember that she says, said, I mean it, I, I mean call it. on me, I mean it. Mm -hmm. And you went out on a, a limb and you, you took her up on that offer and she joyfully accepted that opportunity to serve. Um, and she, you gave her that opportunity to let God make himself known through that friendship. Mm -hmm. And I just thought about, I, I thought about a COVID situation that I encountered. And then I thought back, geez, I mean, how long ago was that? This other thing, 14 years ago, <laughs> this other thing I, in the far reaches. Yeah. The first one was, um, I was kind of calling around, checking up on some people from the parish. Mm -hmm. And um, I spoke to someone and she kind of said, well, you know what happened with my son? And I said, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I did not realize that her son had the coronavirus. And I felt so horrible that I wish I could have helped. You know, I wish I would have known. I wish I could have at least prayed for him because she said it was a very difficult situation as a mother seeing her son sick. And so, and she just assumed that I knew because I was in the parish. And so yeah. I thought of that when I was reading, um, you know, I've read your book before, but now I'm trying to reread it with the, the COVID glasses right. and that opportunity. I think sometimes though, you know, it's kind of a, an, a, as we've gone through this, it's, we're really evolving. Like, you know, is it on surfaces? Is it not? Is how is it transmitted? Like, and we want to respect people. We want to respect, um, we don't want to spread this and, and we, you know, and we want to respect people, but there's a real need still for ministry. Um, even in this time, you were talking about Grubhub, uh, to me yeah. earlier, about yeah. that could be a way to minister. Yeah, so with your with your friend, so I was I was zooming with um, the CWC at Fort Carson earlier this week, and we were talking about you know serving people in need, and and I asked the question, um, it was like how many people how many people want to help someone when they find someone in their community needs help, and I was like show of hands, ladies, because you know they're all a bunch of moms, so like babies are going everywhere on Zoom, so everybody's on mute, so I was like show of hands. If someone in your community needs help, do you want to help them? And everyone's like, yes, I want to help them. And I was like, okay, show of hands. How many of you ask for help? And it was like crickets. No one. Um, and, and I think maybe, you know, in mm -hmm. COVID, none of us are at our best. And that is okay. Like none of us are meant to, we are not meant to minister to each other with like perfectly manicured fingers and perfectly manicured hair or whatever. Um, we're, we're meant to minister each, to each other in the muck of our lives. And um, that, you know, you're, that you found out that your catechist's um, son was ill and you wish you had known, um, I think speaks to how much we, we really do want to help, even if it's, even if all we can do because we're in quarantine is pray, then that's the best thing we can do for someone right now. Um, but, but um, I forget where I was going with this, but um, <laughs> yeah, we want to help. We want to help. So Grubhub. So like, so yeah. how do we help people when, you know, we're, we're afraid or like we're afraid to let people know that we're sick um, or we're afraid to make contact with someone because we're afraid that we might, we might, you know, catch the virus or 
um, if we have immunocompromised people at home, yeah. we have yeah. absolutely legitimate reason, like no judgment on, like if you stay in your house for the next six months, no judgment, you do you. Um, but, but like Grubhub, for example, we found out that a lady in, in, our, in our community, um, it, you know, had a husband had to have surgery and the last thing she needs to be doing is going out to a grocery store, you know, and nursing her sick husband. And so I texted a group of ladies and said, Hey, um, who wants to send Grubhub? Um, because we could send dinner. Like you pick your restaurant and you tip the, you tip the delivery person and voila, dinner shows up at the door. And on Grubhub, there was a choice of leave it at my doorstep. So if you don't want any contact because like you've got illness or you just don't want to be around people or whatever, leave it at my doorstep or give it to my, like, or hand it to me. So it was, it was a great way to, to know that there's an option and not a very expensive option because I texted 10 ladies and had to tell them, don't, don't send me any more money. Like five, yeah don't send me any more money. We've, we've got this covered. So it was, it was a, a very easy way to reach out. And, um, it's a, it's a different way because certainly during, during regular days, like I might've brought her dinner and had dinner with her. Um, you know, Nancy and I, we go way back. And so when you would have babies, we'd bring dinner and have dinner at your house with you. I love how you say babies. <laughs> you, you knew me when I only had three kids. <laughs> you had three kids but like you know I didn't say like, the only time I ever felt comfortable asking for help when I had a baby it was like yeah. bring me the food <laughs> but we like we brought dinner over I mean and and by bringing dinner over I mean one time we picked up pizza and beer at the like deli down the street from your house so this My doesn't have to be <laughs> um, but you know we brought over pizza and I think we made like Duncan Hines brownies or something so mm -hmm. um so just it can be super easy to help someone and um and then you know how old is is Miriam now seven seven years later we're talking about it <laughs> yeah. yeah I know exactly oh. so um well I guess and and we talked about the intro we can always go back and forth but this yeah. is just making me think uh, in chapter one you talk about the spiritual friendships yeah. and um, foundational relationships and you talk about two kinds um the christ-like foundational relationships between women um that may develop into spiritual friendships and right. then the shepherding relationships um between priests and i've seen two different ways during covid that some priests in my community have really gone above and beyond but in their own in the the way they could yeah so we have a young priest he's probably even younger than me okay. and this guy he's a new pastor and he he when he was in fatima a few years ago he picked up a little monstrance and he always wondered what he would use it for and he had this bright idea that um he decided during four weeks four sundays of easter he drove around to every parishioner and he blessed them he drove to their house and blessed them. And it was funny because at first he was said, okay, registered parishioners only. But then he, I saw on Facebook, he's like, okay, I'm driving here and there and there. And I'm like, he's going a little bit out of his way. He spent nine hours in the car for four Sundays in a row to make sure that everyone had a personal blessing. And that so touched me that he went out with Jesus to the people because they couldn't come to him, to, to him, and I thought, what a beautiful service. And you know, his back was aching at the end of that day, and his arms from holding the monstrance. Well, in another parish, we have an older priest. He can't be sitting in a car for nine hours every Sunday. But what he did was he embraced technology, and every single day he said mass, and he posted it. He sent an email every single day to his parishioners, offering that daily mass and he had like fun little videos updates he has a dog and he'd have the dog involved and then every day at 12 he said i'm saying mass for all of you and then at three o'clock you could come and park in the parking lot and he did a benediction and he blessed everyone in the parking lot That's so it was like two ways that we can't all be father david like physically putting ourselves on the line and like going all out but we could be like Father Joe, who can maybe stretch himself technologically, 
and still um, minister to people. Yeah, and it's it's amazing how that sort of how those sorts of gestures are. We would never have thought of processing Jesus in a car for yeah. nine hours on February twenty sixth, and then for four Sundays of Easter, he did that. I love that that he that he brought Jesus to his people, and I love that he went beyond his flock also because COVID is, it's stretching, it's stretching us to serve people who, um, who might have even been away from the church. You know, there's nothing like a crisis that will bring people back to their faith, and they can't come back to the church. So for him to bring the, the monstrance, to bring the, um, the, the body to, to them is, to, to anybody is really, amazing um and I, I think we all appreciate that in a way that in a way now that we we probably didn't even think about beforehand because so many of our parishes have like first friday adoration or or perpetual adoration and when you know now we have real scarcity of access to the sacraments um or access to to adoration and to have that brought to you is is amazing and we've had our priests out here you know we're so I think we're behind, so New York is, you're in New York, I'm in Washington State, New York is opening parishes again, right? Yes, and each parish is kind of doing what they can. Um, the one parish with that Father David I told you about, he opened two weeks ago because he has a very large parish with a lot of volunteers, so they need a lot of volunteers to help usher. Mm -hmm. The other parish with Father Joe is just opening this weekend. So, and they could only have 25% of, um, and so even those two parishes, the one parish says, okay, we can let a hundred people in. And then afterwards they have a really nice um, plot of land that they're on and they have kind of a glass front um, foyer. They're like, bring your camping chairs. You could stay outside and come in to receive communion. Oh, now at really? Joe's church, the, everybody's got to sign up. So okay. it's only a hundred people. So, you know, it's like, we have to be patient also with our priests, with what they can do <laughs> in our parishes. Well, and recognize that a lot of them are on the front lines of, of exposure. Um, like our, our chaplains who are doing hospital visits right now, they're, I mean, they're at risk. So to pray for them, especially in their safety is, is key right now because they're still ministering to people who are who are suffering with with not with with little or I mean with regard but with with like not regard to their own person they're putting their their need to bring the sacraments to those who are suffering above their own personal safety right now so they're taking all the safety of you know healthcare professionals and gowns and gloves and all that but they're still putting themselves at risk and so that's something that I think we have to be particularly appreciative of and to try and show a lot of grace to to mm -hmm. our pastors as they're as they're reopening. Um, and it, you're right, it looks different everywhere. Um, here on Joint Base Lewis McCord, we don't have chapel services reopened yet, but we do have some outdoor services. And so what I've heard from what I've heard from some people and what I've kind of felt is that our services are open for unit, like unit masses. So um, a priest can celebrate, a priest will celebrate mass for you know his unit. Um, but if we're not in the unit, I've hesitated to, I've been invited, so I've, I've definitely felt invited, but I haven't attended because I thought, well, if, you know, my husband's not part of that unit, I don't want to take someone else's spot. Um, so one of our priests this week emailed me and said, hey, I'm celebrating additional masses outside, um, you know, within, within all the rules, here, 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 and here, um, please come. Don't, you know, if if you're comfortable, please come. And so that was really, that was really sweet of him. He's kind of looking out for us. So yeah, yeah, I was, um, we don't have mass on post yet either. I live off post. And like I said, Father David, his parish offered it, but yeah, I felt the same way. I felt that's not my parish. So I didn't want to take a spot from so many, somebody. And then also I hadn't had the chance to go to confession yet. And I really, wanted to be in a state of grace before I received the body and blood again. You know, it's this, it, it's funny. I don't, well, well, I'll see what you think of this. My husband made a analogy about 
Um, cause I told him, I'm like, I'm so excited to receive the Eucharist again. I said, I'm going to be a mess. I can almost like start crying thinking about it right now. And he's like, and of course, cause my husband's a soldier. He's been, as he likes to remind me many months without mass or receiving the body and blood of Christ. He thinks, you know, this is so cute how I'm acting. And he said, but he said something so wise to me. He said, think about reunion after deployment, how it is with you and me. And he's like, you, you're, he's like, you're even kind of, you're romancing this interaction you'll have with Jesus. <laughs> and he's, he said, go slow with it. Go slow and be patient. And I, I've just been thinking, he said that to me like two weeks ago and I can't stop thinking about Paul it. Paul is a wise dude. That's really <laughs> So I'll let you know how it goes, but, um, but I'll, I'm thinking about that to be, to kind of be patient, kind of getting, getting to know Jesus in that, that physical way and thinking about how I've grown. I was thinking about it. Like how, how have I, you know, so many times before Lent, we're like, this Lent's going to be different. And, and I, and I, and I often I just think about how I failed and I thought about COVID and I said, how has it been? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, yeah, I've grown a lot and I've done really good things. Um, I've, th- I've been giving blood more regularly. That's something like I've always wanted to do, mm-hmm. but I, I've given blood twice since COVID happened and made a priority to do it. And some of those things are, like you said, like you have the time to do things, um, one thing is that my children and I have been going to serve at a, um, a food distribution every Wednesday. So because we had time to do that because they were home and my husband was home, um, we've been, we've been doing that. We, it was always a, Oh, I should do it. But I had the time and I knew my neighbors were hurting. Yeah. And so we did it. And now we're regulars at the food pantry, but now because my husband's back at work, we ca- I switch off with the teenagers. So one teenager comes and, and the other one stays home with the other kids. And, uh, and they are finding that it's, I'm teaching them a good lesson. I'm teaching yeah. them how to. Yeah. So in a way it's, I mean, it's getting back to the basics, you know, what is, what has COVID allowed you to do? Get back to what matters and mm-hmm. serving your neighbor is, is what matters. Um, we, so looking at the clock, I think we've been talking for about a half hour. There's one oh, other, <laughs> there's one other, there's one other part of the book that I would like to talk about, which is, which is helping women develop spiritual friendships, um, mm-hmm. during COVID and during this summer of, of transition, because, you know, we, we talked before we started recording about how, um, you know, people during COVID, if they're new to, if they're new to an installation or if they're getting ready to move, they might feel kind of lonely. And so if you get to a new installation, what are, are we so desperate for friends once we get there that we were going to go out and like make friends with anyone or how do we, how do we approach finding good friendships when stuff is still shut down? So what do you, what are your thoughts, Nancy? Put me on the spot. Man, that's so tough. That might be something we're going to have to kick to the ladies on Wednesday. <laughs> well, we could really crowdsource. Yeah, we That's can do that because, well, I think where I, so writing this chapter, so it's amazing what comes out when you write a book. Writing this chapter was kind of cathartic for me because it caused me to like look at some, at friendships that I had, but, it, and say, okay, is this, is this friendship really good for my soul? And some of those conversations I had to have with myself were not very fun. Um, but it also helped me to think of the friends who have just been so tried and true and how I've, how I've met them, how I've developed a friendship with them. And like bar with, without exception, I met all of them, um, through some sort of Catholic connection, um, with, without exception. So I thought that was really interesting to me, but, um, what I went ahead and did today because I am the um, coordinator of religious education for my for West Point. Mm-hmm. I put out on our Facebook page, "Hey, we need catechists," thinking that I might get some new people in. So that's a great way to 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 get involved is to you know and to meet people is to serve, and there is a need. So I said, you know maybe, maybe we'll catch some new people who then they could plug right in. I'm that kind of person. Like I'm the kind of person I, I show up at a new duty station and the next week I'm doing vacation Bible school. So 
you know, that kind of thing is a great way to, um, to, to make some spiritual friends. So find those people that are really focused on the right things. That's what I, not focus on what kind of Polish pottery pattern you have or where'd you get your crystal, but focus on serving the church. And, you know, when you teach your, your learning, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we'll, we'll punt part of that discussion until Wednesday. So Wednesday we can talk about where are you, where are you meeting your spiritual besties? Um, and, uh, I guess characteristics of, of spiritual friends, because that's finding, finding good friends is a good way to get through the loneliness of COVID and you don't need a ton of friends, but if you've got, if you've got one or two, then it just, you know, it just builds your spirit. So we are at 30 minutes. Okay. At least. That wasn't that hard. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we'll close then. I'll let you take it away, Nancy. Okay. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Thank you for inspiration. Please, Holy Spirit, keep inspiring us to find ways to, to serve you and love you in others during this time. Please inspire us in us a spirit, not of fear, but of love and trust in you. And, um, and thank you. Thank you for MCCW. Thank you for this community. And um, please bless all your women. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So I just want to invite everyone to uh, our Zoom chat Wednesday at live, 1900, well, 7 p.m. It's funny, uh, our communications director, Bevan, says, we try not to use military time. So I go back and forth. <laughs> so 7 p.m., uh, Eastern time. Uh, we'll have a live Zoom chat. You can email me at faithformation at mccw.org, but we'll be putting out that information. And if you don't want to join the Zoom call, if you want to watch it, it will be in our MCCW group. So make sure you are part of that. So we'll see you on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for joining us.